Hello, I'm Lucas Kitchen, and in this video, I want to show you a method for using artificial intelligence to better study your Bible. Now, I'm a former pastor, a Christian author, a speaker on Bible subjects, so I need to study the Bible pretty often, and I realized recently that I have basically transitioned how I study the Bible, and I want to tell you about it. So, first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Acts chapter 12. And that's because Acts chapter 12 has a number of things in it that you wouldn't just happen to know by reading the verses. So, in this case, we would normally reach for a commentary off the shelf. I mean, Acts chapter 12, let me read the first sentence. It says, it was about that time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. Now, already I see something that I'd like to know. And if I'm going to teach on this, I'm definitely going to need to know this. But even if I'm just studying my Bible, I want to know which King Herod is this. Because, like, I might have a vague memory that there was more than one King Herod. So let's try to, let's try to put this in context. ChatGPT has been pretty reliable, and I've been using it for... I think about a year now, and I'm pretty confident in what it can do. So I use its conversation feature. Let me show you how that works. In Acts chapter 12, it talks about King Herod. Which King Herod is that? And tell me a little bit about him. In Acts chapter 12, the King Herod mentioned is Herod Agrippa I. He was the grandson of Herod the Great. Agrippa I is known for his persecution of the early Christian church. So... When is Acts chapter 12 believed to have taken place? Acts chapter 12 is believed to have taken place around 44 AD. This estimation aligns with the reign of Herod Agrippa I, who ruled from 41 to 44 AD. So you see how powerful this is without even opening a book. I just had kind of a conversation with my AI assistant and I was able to get clarity on what's in the verse. Okay, so in the story, Peter gets imprisoned after James is killed, and then Peter has this miraculous exodus from the prison, and then he shows up where there are a group of believers who are praying. A young girl comes to the door, and then she, see, she hears Peter and is amazed, and then goes and tells everybody else, but they don't believe her. They don't believe that Peter has been released from prison. So they say a really odd thing to her that for our modern ears just doesn't make much sense. They say, you're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. When I first read that, I came across that. I was like, what does that mean? So this is a point at which I would reach for, yes, my AI assistant. So let's see what ChatGPT has to tell us. In Acts 12, verse 15, it says, it must be his angel. What do the commentators think is the historical significance of that line? In Acts 12, 15, when the believers say, it must be his angel, upon hearing that Peter is at the door, commentators have interpreted this in various ways, reflecting the beliefs and practices of the early Christian community. Some suggest it indicates a belief in guardian angels, where each person has a specific angel assigned to them. This reflects Jewish angelology of that period, where angels were thought to be closely connected to the individuals they protected or represented. Okay, so we can see ChatGPT is good at giving historical background. It's read all of the history, it knows the history. But what about theology? You see, I come from a free grace theology background. So, what that means is when I read the Bible, I'm looking for support for the free grace theological perspective. Now, how could I use ChatGPT to find that? Well, one of the things that you have to do if you're going to use AI as an aid for your Bible study, you need to let ChatGPT know what your theological background is and what you want to hear about. So, let's use this verse as an example. 1 Corinthians 3.15. It says, if it is burned up, and it's talking about a person's life work, what they do with their life, if it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Now, if I come to that verse and I want to know what the free grace perspective on that verse is, I can just simply embed that in the question that I ask ChatGPT as I'm doing my Bible study. 
In Corinthians 3.15, what is it talking about? And especially, give me an answer from a free grace theology perspective. In 1 Corinthians 3.15, Paul talks about a person being saved, yet as one escaping through flames, with their work being burned up. From a free grace theology perspective, this verse is often interpreted as describing believers at the judgment seat of Christ, where their works are evaluated. In this view, the passage is about rewards for believers, not salvation itself. Salvation is already secure through faith in Christ. The works are tested for their value in God's kingdom. If the works are not valuable, they are burned up, symbolizing loss of rewards, but not loss of salvation. The individual is saved, but they escape only with their salvation, without the additional rewards that could have been earned through faithful, God-honoring works. This interpretation emphasizes that salvation is by faith alone, while rewards are based on works. Not bad. That was a pretty good free grace theology answer. Thank you, Chad GPT. So as long as you embed what your expectations are into your questions, Chad GPT can generally give you a, an answer that aligns with your theological perspective, and it can help you in your Bible study. Now, one thing that happens in traditional commentaries is you often just get one, maybe two theological perspectives represented because it's written by one author. ChatGPT is not an author. It is a mirror on a massive amount of uh, text information. So ChatGPT can also educate us on what other theological perspectives are. And I would highly suggest doing this when you're studying your Bible. You might want to ask your AI assistant to help you understand other theological perspectives so that you can have a broader range. So let's try that. How would an Arminian who believes that you can lose your salvation interpret 1 Corinthians 3.15? They may view this verse as a warning to believers. The emphasis would likely be on the seriousness of living a life that aligns with God's will. They might argue that while salvation can be lost according to their theology, this particular verse is not directly addressing that issue. Instead, it's about the importance of living a life that builds upon the foundation of Jesus Christ with actions that have eternal value. So that gives us a sense of what the opposing view in a theological perspective might be based on this verse. So this helps us be more educated on a broader understanding of what different perspectives are. And I actually believe that is valuable. Now I want to show you one more thing that you can use AI to help you in your Bible study with. And it represents a skill that very few humans could actually achieve. Let me show you. Give me a broad overview of what a wide range of commentators think about the theology that is in 1 Corinthians 3.15. Here's a broad overview. One, evangelical perspective. Many evangelical commentators view this verse as addressing believers' works and their quality. They see salvation as secure in faith, with this verse emphasizing the rewards or losses in terms of heavenly rewards, not salvation itself. Two, Catholic perspective. Catholic interpreters often see this passage as supporting the doctrine of purgatory. The fire, in this view, purifies the believer, suggesting a process of purification after death for sins. Three, liberal theological perspective. Liberal theologians might focus more on the community aspect, seeing the passage as a metaphor for how the community's actions impact its collective spiritual health. I'm going to cut it off because it can go on and on and on, but you get to see the power of AI in being able to take a broad sense of what many, many commentators have thought, and it can distill it down to these very simple ideas. So, as you can see through these different methods, I really believe that AI can help you in your Bible study, whether you are a preacher preparing for a sermon, or you're just a person who wants to know more about God's Word and understand it better. I think AI can help you, but it does come with a disclaimer. You still need to check what you study. You still need to also pray about it. You still need to verify things with trusted believers who you have in your life. So AI is just a mirror. It's just a reflection of what other authors 
and commentators have said it's not thinking it doesn't have a the, uh, you know theological thought it's just reflecting back what the library of writers biblical writers have said and so remember that that just like you might not trust a specific commentator on a certain verse in the bible there's things that chat gpt will say that you probably shouldn't trust because it's just a reflection of what somebody else has said. But with that disclaimer and that understanding, you can quickly and efficiently gain a pretty broad sense of what people have said about specific verses. Well, that's all I have for you. If you are using AI in a unique way to study the Bible, I'd like to hear about it. Send me a message or uh, link a video in the comments of this video. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification button if you want to get more content like what you saw in this video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.